Great. Well, welcome everybody to a talk about preparing your cashmere fiber for processing. We're lucky today to be joined by Deirdre Bushnell from Still River Mill in Connecticut. Um, she started this mill in 2004 and um, in this mill, she's been focusing on um, not only wool, but a lot of specialized fiber, including cashmere. She also uh, works with uh, everything from Quivic, Yak, um, Alpaca, Mohair, um, and has a number of services available that she'll discuss in the upcoming thing. Um, what's particularly special about her mill is she focuses on um, eco-friendly processing. And um, yeah, we're, we're on behalf of CGA, we're thrilled that you could take some time to join us and teach our membership a bit about preparing their cashmere for processing. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so basically, um, we process, we, we have many, many uh, batches of fiber on the mill floor at any one given time. Um, so we have that structured so that we're able to really give the right attention to the fiber that, or the, the uh, requirements that the fiber is needing at the time as we're processing. Um, so there is a lot involved and there's a lot of things that you kind of have to ask yourself before you even start. So I'm gonna attempt here tonight to kind of go over um, maybe where you do start. You have fiber or you have potential fiber that's still on your animal and you want to try your hand at taking it further into yarn or products or, or something like that. So um, when you're trying to decide what to do, it can be a little bit overwhelming because when it comes to fiber processing, there are no rules. And, um, you know, we are here to kind of help you thread the needle to help you get to your um, desired end result whether it whether you're processing just a little bit of fiber or you've got a hundred pounds and you're trying to hit a, a certain market, we do our best to try to um, gear your product so that you're going to be successful the most. So um, before we get into the fiber part, what I like to kind of go over with customers is what are your goals in the processing? Do you want to be selling your fiber? Do you just want to use it for your own personal use? Is there a specific end product that you are hoping to be able to create um, either now or in the future? And if you don't know what you want to do with it, that in and of itself is an answer because that um, will tell us maybe which way to steer your processing so that you'll have the most versatile end product. When you decide what you wanna do, you ha will hopefully be able to um, have something that you can use. Um, so uh, the other thing that people kind of don't have an idea is what is their expected yield? So they've got some fiber, how much are they gonna get back? So there's trends. I mean, every batch of fiber has its own yield, um, but there's, there's trends that happen. So for the most part, if you've got two pounds of raw cashmere, that's going to equate to be about a pound of finished. So about half of your raw weight is what you can expect. Um, and this is where um, I may not know exactly on the goat end of it, but for instance, my goats, I get, oh, at least six to eight ounces of finished 
product from each go. So um, I can kind of judge how much I'm gonna get based on how many goats I've got. And then of course there's variables as to, well, how much cashmere were you actually able to get off of the goat? Did you get all of it? Did you just get some of it? So there, you, there's a lot of factors that will affect all of that. So once you kind of have an idea of what you wanna do and you kind of have an idea of, um, what your yield might be, the next step is to collect your fiber. Um, so I'm not really here to teach how to do that, but I wanna share some of the factors that really do affect how the fiber processes in that action of either combing or shearing or whatever. So the best way to start with good quality fiber is really the year before you're gonna collect it. So things like nutrition can greatly affect how well the fiber processes, if it's slightly weak or um, you know, other aspects that are going on with the animal. Sometimes the fiber is the first thing that you know, is gonna get neglected. So we actually were, processing for the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, they have the kiviat that they have captive there. And um, we had gotten, and you know, they each police had each animal's name and there was a little bull Franklin and his fiber would just, you know, break up and pill. There was nothing we could do to it to keep it from breaking. And there was a one year in particular that was happening to many of their animals fleeces. And the next year, um, the operator called me up and she said, we lost all of our animals because they had a severe copper deficiency. And, you know, had we known that we probably would have been able to tell them there is something wrong based on how that fiber was processing. So it was actually very interesting to um, see the effects of that on the fiber itself. Um, you know, the other thing is, is that the down fibers, the like cashmere, kiviat, yak, all of those fibers are so small in micron that if there is any um, weak spot, there's, you know, it's a very fine hair to begin with. So that can really um, affect the processing. The other thing that is a challenge is dandruff. So um, I know that my goats had gotten the uh, biting lice and it was actually creating little bits of dandruff on them. Um, we see that, you know, pretty regularly, the, there will be some dandruff and fiber. Um, sometimes the challenging part with dandruff is that the hairs are actually penetrating that piece of dandruff. And so it doesn't fall out because it just gets carried along for the ride. Um, and the other item that you kind of want to be careful with is vegetable matter. So obviously any prickers or anything that the animal is, um, you know, picking up in the pasture, uh, hay, um, you know, all of that, at least when I do my goats, I try to kind of lightly brush them off to remove any vegetable matter before I start trying to comb their cashmere. Um, if you can pick it out of your collected fiber, that's always a nice thing to do. And that, you know, it we, we can tolerate some in a reasonable amount, but an excessive amount um, can actually be quite problematic. And then the other factor is when you actually are harvesting that fiber. It tends that if you are late to combing, you're actually gonna be collecting a lot of dandruff because the animal is 
you know, shedding his skin at, or her skin at the same time as well. So um, not that any of these things can't be dealt with, but it's just best to hopefully try to avoid having as much of that in your fiber as possible. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, and this might be a little bit of a controversial issue, is the combing versus shearing. Um, and in my opinion, the verdict is still out from, and this is just from a processing perspective, um, you know, when you're combing, it's nice to be able to just spend, you know, a half an hour, an hour and get all the cashmere, but that may not happen. If you shear, you are able to actually capture all of that cashmere and, um, you know, there is obviously a lot of extra guard hair in there, but then you can evaluate the cost of removing that extra hair versus the cost of the labor of collecting your cashmere and maybe not getting all of it. Um, so those are just some things to think about. Um, and if we want to talk about kind of the, the costing of those two things, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about it. We've done it with a few customers and um, it seems to be, you know, in, in the ballpark as far as, you know, whether it's a viable economic exercise. We have some questions that are starting to come in about those sure. topics. Would you like to answer Absolutely. them now or hold them? Okay. Yeah, so we the can talk about First one is your thoughts on what causes dandruff and how a producer can either prevent it or get rid of it. Well, I'm kind of stepping outside of my lane here. Um, but I do know that if you are combing, if you comb earlier than later, there's a lot less dandruff. And you know, any of the mites, if you can kind of treat for that. Um, but other than that, um, that kind of leads into the next step is, okay, you've got your fiber, then you can kind of go through it and group it and skirt it. Um, so when it comes to fiber, fiber processing is a bit counterintuitive. So if there's a little bit of not so good stuff in with a bunch of beautiful stuff, the not so good stuff makes the beautiful stuff not so good. So, um, you know, if there are fiber that comes in and there's a particular batch that has a lot of dandruff, we just keep it separate and we might do a different um, processing with that. So we save the good stuff so it's not contaminated with the bad stuff. And, you know, there, there are things that can be done that will, you know, kind of make that dandruff not so, make it more tolerable. The next question we have in is if you, um, regarding combing versus shearing, if you have, um, part of your herd is shorn and part of your herd is combed, can you process that together? Uh, yeah, what we would do is we would wash both your shorn and your combed fibers, and then we would perform a, a step. We call it fiber cleaning, but it's basically a light dehairing. Um, on the shorn fiber. And what that does is it pretty much removes all of that extra guard hair so that the output from that process is about the same as the combed fiber. But, um, you know, depending on the volumes and, and the weights of the two, we probably would take them through to a final dehair separately, and then we could combine them after they're dehaired. Great. Uh, another question and a compliment came in from Karen, who's used you to process her fiber, has been very happy with the results. Um, she says she's been keeping two goats whose fiber tends to felt in separate bags to help 
you on your end. She's asking, is this a good way to assist you in processing? Um, yes and no. So, um, let, let me answer that question and move on to sort of the, the next phase here. So let's say you've got your fiber and you're gonna wanna skirt it. So um, you can go through and remove things that obviously you don't want in the batch. So the rule of thumb is what you give us is what we give back. So clearly, if there are things that you could just quickly, you know, pull out or whatever, you should do that. And that's kind of what I consider skirting with um, cashmere. It, it's a much different process than skirting an alpaca fleece or a, a sheep fleece. Um, but basically, you just want to go through and remove what you can. And then you want to address any matting. So the rule of thumb with mats and, and felted bits is that if you can pull it apart by hand, we're gonna be able to do that as well and turn it back into fluff. If it is so matted that you just can't pull it apart with your hands, then you know pull that out, wash it, make a cat toy out of it or something. Um, you know, the same with vegetable vegetable matter, you want to, um, you know, remove that the best you can. If you've got long guard hairs, you see them, pull them out. Um, sections with excessive dandruff, pull those out of the batch, and then maybe we can make a batch of dandruff. And we could talk about some things you can do with that. Um, so when you're going through your fiber, the rule of thumb is, is that if you've got a little bit in your hand and you say, I wonder if this is good enough, the answer is probably not. So, um, you know, if you, if you are, you know, not sure, separate it out, send it, and I am happy to decide. I mean, we are not, miracle workers, but we do have a few magic tricks, tricks up our sleeves. So, um, you know, it needs to be extreme for us to say, oh, this is just trash. But it, it's, it, once you start to do it, it, it can be fairly obvious and not, you know, too hard of a process. Um, so then, okay, after you've got your fiber, sorted and skirted and all of that then and and you've done any data recording that you want to do if you want to record how much you know certain you're getting yield from a certain animal or you know whatever information you want to get for your own personal records by all means do that but don't send me 50 little baggies um i i don't need it that way so what makes it easier for us is if you group the fiber um, either physically in, in its own bag or whatever, or labeled with instructions as to what you want in different batches. So to answer the question, if there's um, some matted if, if one goat has matted fiber and the other one doesn't, but you really would like them to be one batch, um, I don't need it separated. You know, we can go through and, you know, pull out what's usable and, you know, throw out or return what, what isn't. Um, and for those who have a lot of fiber, you know, you can create batches obviously by color, micron, um, you know, you might want some of the not so great fiber to go into some kind of a blended yarn or, you know, have different fiber that you want to turn into different end products, by all means you can do that. But for a lot of people with, you know, just a few goats, very often all of their fiber needs to be included 
in one batch. Um, and, and we can talk about that aspect if there's no more questions and I can keep going. There's a few more questions. Would you okay. like to do them or hold them till the end? No, we can well, we can do the questions about fiber sure. prep. Yeah. Um, so one question from David is, what is the difference between recovery of combed versus shorn fle uh, fleeces? Well, on my, I can only talk about my equipment. Um, so in that process that I outlined earlier, where we do that extra step for the shorn fleeces, um, the yield is pretty much the same as the combed. So I would take the shorn fiber, do the fiber uh, cleaning on it, and I'm going to have a much smaller bag and a, probably a very large bag of guard hair. But the weight of the pre-processed shorn fiber is probably going to have the same yield as the combed fiber through the, the real de-airing. Speaking of uh, processing, what about the length of the guard hair? Does it affect the processing? Absolutely, yeah. So, and again, this is on my, um, on my processing. So with our uh, de-hairing technology, it's, it's basically separating on centrifugal force. So you take the fiber and you spin it around and then the heavier stuff flies off and the lighter stuff passes on to the next drum. So the diameter or half the circumference of the drum is like, oh, I don't know, 10 or 12 inches. So sometimes those long guard hairs get attached to the drum and they just like to just stay in. Um, so it can be a little bit problematic getting them to behave as guard hairs properly. Um, but with cashmere specifically, we haven't really seen it to be too much of a problem. Um, if you know, we see a long guard hair and it shouldn't be there, we just pick it out and, and it's easier to pull out. Um, where we see trouble is with Kiviet, where they have guard hair that you know some of it is 24 inches long. Um, so those can those can be a problem. So you've actually just answered uh, the final pending question we have is about pr how the dehairing process is actually done. Oh, um, so that yeah. So the dehairing is basically a set of rollers, and the fiber travels from one roller to the other, um, and we have. Well, we have two dehairing machines. We have a large one and a small one. The small one we use for the fiber cleaning, which is what I explained with the shorn fiber. Um, but if if you want, I can show you the dehair. Hold on, let me see if I can't turn my camera around. Oh, there we go. Whoops. Okay, so this is our dehairing machine. So you can see the white belt. And this is where you load up the fiber. And here's some fiber that Ray left when he went home. He's gonna work on this first thing tomorrow morning. So this is some fiber that is close to being done. And I don't know if you can see some guard hairs in there. They're subtle, they're white and shiny, but you know, they're in there. So when the, when the machine is on, the fiber goes in and passes from drum, from drum to drum to drum to drum. So this is the side of the machine. So the fiber is gonna pass through the machine. And as 
it's doing that, the heavier fiber falls down into the bin. It's kind of hard to see with the lighting here. But then as after it goes through all of these drums, it will come out the other end and this comb will go up and down and comb the fiber and it will end up in this bucket. So this is the fiber that's on the other end. So this is pretty much done. So when we are dehairing a batch, the fiber gets washed and it starts off through the machine for the first time. And we can adjust the speeds of all of the action that's going on here. So we run it through and a lot of the guard hair will fall out, but it's obviously not gonna be good enough. So then the fiber comes back and we run it through again. And again, what's coming out the back is gonna be much better, but still it's, probably gonna still have some guard hairs. So typically we will run the fiber through three times. Um, and the final fiber that comes out the back will be in pretty good shape, but then we're still not done. So as we are dehairing and the guard hair is falling down in these bins, we're also collecting some down. So hold on a minute, I gotta use two hands here. <laughs> so this is the fiber that fell down into the bin. And it's gonna be hard to see in this lighting, but this really is um, quite a lot of guard hair. And the down that's in here is quite short. And so this down is unprocessable. So what's in this bin, which if I were to weigh it, it's probably, oh, maybe 10 ounces or so. It looks fluffier than it really is. But this came from a 15 pound batch. So it looks like it's a lot of cashmere, but relatively speaking, it's a, it's a low percentage. So um, after the first three runs, we will take all the fiber out of the bin and we rerun it again to get any down out of the guard hair. So it's never really a black and white uh, situation. There's always a little bit of judgment involved, um, but we've been doing this long enough where, you know, we can pretty much tell by, um, you know, the, the returned weight and what the waste is looking like as to whether it will dehair further or, or not. So that is the dehairing. So uh, throughput, if we end up with a pound a day, that was a good processing day. So um, it's time consuming and it can be a little tedious, um, but it's an extremely gentle dehairing action unlike some of the, the larger commercial dehairing machines. Um, you know, so we are actually able to dehair fiber that, uh, you know, on the larger textile arena, it, it can be a little problematic. It's really cool to see that. Um, we have a question from Amanda S. She asks yeah. if you ever use the waste, like the guard hair or the little bits of cashmere that are too short, um, in that bin that you showed us below. Do you use that to uh, as a core spin yarn for rugs or any yes. other things? Yeah. So um, for some reason, the cashmere waist doesn't make as nice of a core spun as like the yak waist. Um, it's still tender. So if you were to take that core spun and weave a rug, it would be just a really soft, luxurious rug, but you wouldn't want to put it on your back door. You know, you would probably want to use it as, oh, I don't know, maybe a chair pad or, um, you know, something 
next to your bed so we can get out and put your bare feet on it. Uh, we have a question from Gretchen who asked, um, who is the manufacturer of your dehairing machine? Oh, we use the mini mill equipment. They are also known as international spinners. They're from Prince Edward Island. Um, so we started in 2004 with one suite of equipment um, and very quickly we realized we needed two and a half mils worth of equipment. So we have a lot of parallel processing cues happening. Um, some fiber takes a long time for a small amount. Some fiber goes pretty quick. Um, you know, so like I said, we have a lot of fiber in different batches going through its process at, at any given time. Um, so the Belfast Mini Mill equipment, hold on, I'm gonna turn the camera around again. So it's really great because all of the parts are made from things that you can get at the hardware store if a part runs out or McMaster car online, there's no proprietary equipment. Um, so these are our two dehairs here. And then we have our two carters in the background. And then I'm just gonna sneak down here. So this is the tail end of the carders. So after we're carding, we are putting roving and filling up the cans. And the, all this is gonna be going on to yarn. A lot of people just want roving. So this would be the end for those batches. Um, then we have our drafting machines that prep the roving coming off the carter for the spinner. And then we have our spinners over here. So we have two spinners that spin knitting sized yarn. And then over here, we have our lace weight spinner, which is what we spin cashmere and kivit on. And you really need to make a very fine so that you can get good strength and twist without sacrificing the softness. So, um, you know, generally speaking, and, and there are no rules, but generally speaking, when you're making a cashmere yarn, you want to make that lace single and then build up the thickness of the yarn with plies. So this, what I'm showing you now is our plier, which is another spinner, but we just basically use that to ply the yarn. So up here, there were some spin spindles from the lace weight that we were plying before we went home for the night. And then over here, we have our skein winders where we're packaging the yarn and we have several skein winders. And then over here we have our cone winder and our steamer. Um, and I, I can talk about the specifics, but this is some, I don't know what color it looks like on the screen, but it's a beautiful moss green. This is Kiviet. Um, this just got spun and you can see it's quite fine. So this is how we left the mill when we went home tonight. So um, the equipment is sized uh, as a suite so that each machine can kind of keep up or produce enough for the next step. So we're kind of a well-tuned, I tried to press the button here. We're kind of a, a well tuned process. Um, so that, that's the benefit of sticking with one manufacturer's equipment is that you don't get bottlenecks because it does you no good if your spinner can spin 48 pounds a day, but you can only card 10 pounds a day. Um, you know, so it, it's helpful for it to be balanced. 
We have a question from David. He's asking how important is the washing and how do you do that? The washing is the most important part. Um, because what we're doing actually is we are asking the fiber to separate from its neighbor, slide along its neighbor, stick together, but not too tight, and then cooperate when it is speeding at about 30 miles an hour and drafting and getting a little twist applied to it. So if the washing isn't done well and there's dirt or fine silt, um, greases, sweat, uh, all, all those things, it can affect how the fiber comes out. So we have um, the, wa the washing system and I am gonna turn myself around here so I can show you it. We have two washers that we use and you know, like I said, we're well balanced. So I'm running these washers pretty much all day long. So you very simply, you know, put the batch that you're gonna wash and distribute the weight so it stays balanced. Um, when I'm washing cashmere, I probably don't put any more than three pounds in for a wash. Um, and it takes about an hour and a half to actually do the washing. Um, and you know it's it's enough to keep up with the dehairer. So um, I'm not washing a tremendous amount, but when you do wash a small amount, you have the ability to get it cleaner because there's going to be less clumping and less um, fiber filtering the dirt in back into the fiber when when it's getting washed. So these are our washing systems here. And Greg, my husband has, partner in crime, has um, done a little bit of modification, which makes the washing really, really, really effective. So what he did is he drilled some holes in the bottom, which you can't see, and he's attached an ozone creation box right here. So when we turn the water on, it creates a suction using the Turi suction and will actually suck the ozone and add that into the supply water. So um, we seal the lid and we pressurize it with the shot vac, which is that orange hose. So as the water is filling up, the fiber basically gets has water falling on it and water coming up from the bottom and then a little bit of a vacuum pushes the water into the center of that fiber. And then in the meantime, that basket on the inside slowly turns. So the water is able to get swished, excuse me, the fiber is able to get swished through the water, um, which allows it to get nice and clean and then that inside we'll do a high speed extraction in between the wash and rinse cycles. So um, we get the fiber really nice and clean every so once in a while, um, you know, the fiber will be extra dirty and it might need a second wash. Uh, but you know, it's not really the end of the world. If that happens, you just wash it again. Question from David. He's asking if you use detergent during the wash. Oh, absolutely. So this is my soap bucket right here. Buy it, a 50 gallon drum, it's concentrated. And I go through about one of those every, I don't know, eight weeks or so, eight, 10 weeks. So we use a soap that is specifically formulated for washing fiber. Um, it, really gets all the dirt and grease and oils off without stripping the fiber of its natural luster. So um, it's a really great, great product. Not cheap. Sorry. There we go. 
question came in asking how your detergent does with Bucky smells. Can you process um, cashmere from Bucks? We have, um, we have had a problem in the past with the odor still being there when the fiber gets a little wet. Um, however, I'm not sure that has been an issue since we've added the ozone. Because essentially that odor is, is an oil and the oil can get washed off. Is that, is that it for the questions for now? We're, yep, we're caught up for now. Okay, so, um, you know, getting back to getting your batches together, um, usually a good rule of thumb is, is two pounds raw is really enough to get through the entire process without, you know, challenging the minimums. Um, Sorry, I have a flyer. Um, however, for us to process it, we don't need that much. Um, we could process, you know, three quarters of a pound of washed fiber. The only um, thing about that is when you get into a really small batch, you're then optimizing your loss. So uh, when, it, when we're in the de-herring stage, you're gonna lose probably a little bit more down than you need to, that you wouldn't lose if it was a larger batch because um, you know, it, it's a it's a percentage loss. You're going to lose a certain amount of fiber regardless of the size of the batch. So you're going to, you know, lose the same amount whether the batch is eight ounces or eighty pounds. So there's a little bit that doesn't get through the dehair. Then the same with the carter. There's a little bit that just doesn't make it into the final roving. And then on the spinner, you know, we, if we're making a two ply yarn, if one of the rovings is a couple of inches longer than the other, then that equates to, well, there's a couple of feet of a single that doesn't have a pair to ply it with. So all of these little losses are fairly negligible when the result is a pound, but when you get under that, it's not that it can't be done, it's just probably not the most cost effective that it could be. So um, I know a lot of people who kind of save their fiber and process every two years so that they can have enough of that batch. Or there are some people who just want to enjoy their fiber and you know whether they pay $12.50 an ounce or $13.50 an ounce, in the end, you know they, they don't care. It's more important that they have the fiber to use. So, um, you know, like I said, there's really no rules. It's, it's whether it works into your goal and your game, your original game plan. So uh, I think I kind of stepped ahead. The next thing I was gonna talk about was, you know, just the processing overview and what happens to your fiber. So we talked about, uh, we, we take it in, we get it out of all of its bags, we weigh it. That's the way that we're going to charge you for washing. And you went over the, or you got to see the washing system. And then we put the fiber in our drying room and then we will weigh it again. And the washed weight is the weight that we're charging you for the de-herring. Um, and then we saw the dehairing machine and then the dehaired weight you're resulting down is the weight that is going to be 
you know, either the carding charge or um, whether we're going to be blending it. We use our fiber cleaner, which is <laughs> the machine that we run the shorn cashmere through. We run that. We also use the same machine as kind of like a pre-card. It blends the fiber really well. Again, when, when we're working with cashmere and some of these down fibers, they really need to be handled gently. So, um, you know, sometimes it's just too much for the carter to take that cashmere and blend it with the silk and then card it really nicely as well. So we, we would blend the fibers on the fiber cleaner and then the fiber would go blended to the carter. So the yield from your cashmere, if you wanted to say add a 20% silk, we would use that yield to determine, well, how much is 20% of the silk um, and continue through that way. So the one thing I did kind of skip over a little bit was the carter. Um, that is, we, we run at different speeds and we feed the carter with a different rate based on what the, the fiber is and what we're making. Um, so that carter basically takes your dehaired down and arranges it and lines it up and organizes it. Um, and that's really the main function because at that point, all of the equipment and the whole goal is basically to just arrange the fiber into narrower and narrower arrangements of lined fiber so that we get to the final diameter of the yarn so that we can add twist. So there's a lot of fancy equipment and a lot of stuff going on to basically just do a simple task. Um, so, uh, one of the uh, issues with washing is that when we're washing cashmere, we generally get the same yield from the wash. So it's typically, typically you lose about 15% of your weight in the washing. And that's not any hair loss. That's basically just, you know, grease and dirt and you know, sweat, um, it looks clean, but it, it has 15% weight there that you don't really, really want. The dehairing, um, some of the problems with the dehairing is, uh, again, weak fiber can be a problem in the dehairing. Dandruff will impede the dehairing action because it basically just you know, glues a whole bunch of fibers together and we want them to separate and the uh, dandruff keeps that from happening. Long guard hairs, um, we talked about that a little bit. And, um, you know, when in the dehairing process, the whole point is your yarn is only a soft as the coarsest fiber that's in it. So the goal is, is to remove as much of the coarse fiber as we can. Um, well, within reason, I mean, we don't wanna overdo it and lose um, fiber that is still good to use. So, you know, there's a fine line there. Typically we don't have major problems on the dehairing. Um, talked a little bit about the blending, when it comes to carding, that's the point where it's kind of nice to have a pound if we're talking cashmere, just because you know we're sticking the fiber in the machine and it's doing its dance between you know the big drums and the little drums. And again, you kind of want to have that mass so that you get good carding action and you get most of the fiber coming out of the machine after it goes in. Um, and then the next step, which was the pre-drafting for the spinners, where we see problems there is when we have really short fiber length. So the dehairer can, can take good action on short fiber as well as the carter. Um, 
But once we start trying to draft that fiber thinner and thinner and thinner, if the fiber isn't that long to begin with, it can only, you know, it needs to overlap its neighbor a little bit without developing a thin spot. So if you have a lot of short fibers getting pulled apart before it's spun, you've got a thick spot, like a very thin spot and another thick spot. So that can cause um, some problems on the spinner. So when that is the case, we generally recommend doing a blend of a longer fiber to act as a bit of a crutch. So those shorter fibers have something to hang on to and, and position themselves where they really need to be. And that makes a huge difference um, if you have that as a problem. So are there any other processing questions? Yes, lots more questions have come in. Um, question from David and Mary. Um, when producers store their fibers, what storage conditions would you recommend? Um, well, obviously the fiber should breathe. Uh, you don't want it sweating. Um, and you want to keep it where moths don't exist. So don't keep it in your barn. Bring it in, um, you know, find a closet or whatever, and, and it will store quite a long time if it doesn't get moisture and doesn't get bugs in it. Um, you know, don't store it in the horse stall and let the horses stamp, stomp on it and get it covered with alfalfa. Um, you know, you just, just you know common sense and it it stores perfectly fine at least we haven't seen fiber that's deteriorated because it's several years old great question from amanda s do you have the ability oops uh ability to create combed top or just roving pin drafting cloud uh no we don't pin draft um, we are a semi-worsted facility. We do not do worsted processing, which is what the top does. So um, the top is a second step before the spinner. So after it's carded into roving, those rovings are then combined and reconstituted into top. And there's a lot of um, waste fiber in that top making process. So, um, I mean, there, there's definite benefits. I'm not saying I don't want to be able to make top because I am looking into it. However, when somebody gives me their three pound batch, if I were to make top from it, I might give them a pound of waste from that process. Um, all the commercial cashmere yarn, at least all that I've seen, is worsted prepped and worsted spun. Um, and that has a very distinct texture to the fabric that it makes. Our yarns, because they're semi-worsted, bloom a little bit. Um, not as much as woolen spun, but people remark. And they don't really know why it's different, but the yarn gets softer and it has a, you know, it, it tends to get a bit of a halo. Um, and there's a lot of benefit to that, which I was um, going to be talking about in a little bit. Question from Joanne, what length would you consider short fiber for cashmere processing? An inch. Great. Um, question from? Well, 30, 30 millimeters. All right. Can be getting a little short. Question from Elise. Uh, what other fiber do you think blends best with cashmere? Um, well, OK, so that, let's talk about blending. Um, so there's many approaches where blending works well. Um, if you want to blend just to create uh, 
a different feel to your fabric. So you want to affect the drape or um, affect the hand, make a stiffer fabric. Um, you want to blend with fibers that are complete opposite in characteristics. So some of the nice um, blending fibers, which are going to really make your cashmere pop, are things that are not like cashmere at all. Um, things like uh, silk and linen, bamboo, hemp, um, merino, even though merino is really soft and crimpy, the merino wants to gravitate towards the core of the yarn, which will leave your cashmere blooming around the outside. So that's actually a nice thing to do to just kind of beef up your yield because, um, and this gets back to the semi-worsted process. So because we are gently forming the fibers into yarn and adding some twist, it gives the merino a chance to do what it wants to do, which is gravitate towards the core of the yarn and cashmere is going to want to kind of bloom and surround the outside of the yarn. So often, even if you have a 50-50 cashmere merino blend, once the yarn is made and knit and that item is, you know, wet blocked or whatever, that cashmere is really going to bloom. And it's hard to tell that it is only 50% cashmere. It feels like it's a lot more cashmere. Um, so if you, uh, oh, oh, so getting back to the blending fibers, so there are some fibers that might compete a bit with your cashmere because of that. Um, and that is things like Angora Rabbit. Angora Rabbit is going to have a taller bloom than your cashmere. So you might be able to see the cashmere, you might be able to, you'll, you'll know it's in there, but you're not gonna be able to feel it because all you're gonna feel is that angora fiber surrounding, you know, more of the outside of the diameter. Same with mohair. Alpaca likes to do that kind of tall bloom and, and dog hair as well. So, um, you know, like I said, there are no rules. If you want to make a cashmere yarn with your sheep that you have on the farm and throw in some of your guard dog hair and make, you know, a yarn that's unique to your operation and your project, I I'm going to be like, yeah, let's go for it. But it's going to not be... Uh, you know, it's, you're not gonna be able to compare it to other cashmere yarns because you've got that dog in there that you're probably gonna feel feeling more of, and it's probably a higher micron. So, um. So are we good on questions for now? We do have another question, but we're we're at the hour. So do, oh, do you okay. want to, um, I, I don't want to um, keep asking questions. If, if you had some points you wanted to make, we can hold the questions. Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up here. So why don't I do that? And then we can, I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer as many questions as people have. Um, Perfect. So one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is, uh, for those who want to sell, um, there are some things to consider in that, um, you know, unless you have a, a specific uh, pattern, if you're going to be selling the yarn that you want it to match, or, um, you know, you want to be making a very specific end product, if you just want to sell general yarn, um, it's, it's good to know your market because, you know, cashmere is expensive and you don't want to be making 
a skein that really needs to be, or a yarn that really needs to be a two ounce or four ounce skein because of its diameter, because your cost is by weight. However, uh, yarn buyers are considering yardage per price. So by going with a lace yarn or a fingering yarn, you know, you can get a respectable amount of yardage in that one ounce skein so that, you know, your skeins are, you know, a reasonable price and, you know, somebody doesn't have to spend, you know, $150 for that one skein of yarn. Um, and the, and then the other thing is if you're selling, you, you um, there are things you can do to keep your costs down. And once we get the fiber, the fiber that loses the least amount in the wash, has the highest yield on the dehairer, ends up probably making more product, but your cost per pound is gonna be less than you know, if you lose 20% in the wash rather than 15. If you only get 50% yield through the dehairing rather than what's you know the the sixty five percent, which is most typical, um, you know you you are adding cost to your final product. So that is something that's um, you know probably good to kind of keep track as to well, what is the condition of the fiber? And um, you know it it could be that 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 lack of effort on your part may not be enough of a cost in the long run to offset you doing it yourself. And that's kind of where this shearing versus combing comes in. Um, so a customer last year gave me pretty much half and half combed and shorn. And it turned out that the finished yarn was only uh, about $3.75 or $4 more than the combed yarn. But what that meant was, is that she didn't have to spend all those hours combing and she probably got more cashmere off her shorn goats. So she paid $50 more, but did she make that $50 in the collecting part? So all of that, I can't answer for you. That is something that, um, you need to answer for yourself and how that works into your operation. And, um, you know, whatever works, works. And that's what you should go with. But it is, a, it, it's an interesting thing to, to be thinking about. Um, so anyway, just, just to wrap up, um, you know, I find myself saying things um, a lot. I repeat things a lot that I notice. And, and, you know, the one thing I say is, you know, skirt the best you can, but don't drive yourself crazy. I mean, like I said, we've got a few tricks up our sleeve and, you know, this, this shouldn't be painful. Um, and the other thing that, I say a lot is that there are no rules. And if you go through the process and you love what your outcome was, then you did everything right. So, um, you know, I think it's just important to not be afraid to experiment. And, you know, even if your yarn doesn't come out as well as you were hoping for, yarn is not an end product. Yarn is the means to make fabric and that fabric has a use. And many, many, many times that yarn that may not be so great, once it's turned into fabric, it becomes quite lovely. So that, that is uh, actually something that the, the fabric always comes out nicer than you might think. So don't be afraid to try things and you know use what you have and Try again next time.
Great. Well, I do have another question that came in from Amanda S. She asks, um, so there are certain fiber preparations that may be better suited for hand processing versus mill processing due to waste caused by machine usage? Um, well, I'm a little biased on that. Um, for my machinery, we can do everything you can do by hand and probably better with other larger type of operations, I would agree to that. So, you know, I got into this as a hand spinner and I, I will tell you, I'm never ever gonna hand process anything ever again. If I want a yarn, I just come up and I make it. So, and I'm very happy to do the same thing for you. Great, um, question, do you dye cashmere? Yes. Yep, so we actually have our own line of dyes. They're uh, got certified and they are an acid dye, but they are a new um, technology, an acid dye technology that's actually being used in the textile arena today. Um, so they don't create any hazardous waste and they can be put in effluent without affecting aquatic life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that's really great about them is that they can be used like mixing paints. So you don't have to be a master dyer to get the results you're looking for. So when it comes to dyeing, there's several places where dyeing can occur. So uh, with cashmere, um, I generally never dye before the fiber is dehaired. But once the fiber is dehaired, then there's some different options. So if we were to dye the dehaired down and that was just gonna get turned into yarn, that's a nice technique because it gets a very even, it, you know, you dye all the fibers, but then the fibers still get mixed. You get a very even yarn. But what I like to do is dye, the fiber and then do the blending. So you can actually dye, you know, fiber different colors and then blend them together to create a color. Um, and then you can go ahead and, and finish processing that through to roving or yarn. You can stripe the yarn, you can stripe your roving, um, or you can just make a bunch of yarn and you can hand paint it. So. That is something that our customers do for themselves. We don't offer hand painting as a service, unfortunately. Question from me. Um, many of us have small herds with goats that produce different colors of cashmere. Um, do you typically process them all together? All the different colors together? Um, that is something that I discuss on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. So for instance, um, I, I'm working on a, a batch right now where the customer has under a pound of white, and then she has over two pounds of taupe. Um, so instead of just blending it all together, she wanted me to take a little bit of the taupe and add it to the white, and then she'll have two colors. However, we could have just kept them separate. She would have, you know, had a little bit of extra loss. So, you know, instead of returning the 65% of her washed or, or her dehaired, um, fiber in yarn, she might have gotten, you know, 58% or whatever. But when you're talking about such a small amount, it would have been, I mean, it, it, it was six of one half dozen of the other, but she chose to have uh, two batches that were a little bit closer in weight. So if you've got 
four colors and they're all under a pound, I'm probably okay. gonna talk to you about combining that into either two batches or, or one batch. It, it can also depend on what you wanna be doing with it. Great question from David and Mary at Doehaven. Do we make an appointment to bring the fiber for processing? Uh, sure, you can do that, or you can also just mail your fiber. So what we like people to do is go onto our website, and from our processing tab, you can um, click on the order form and print it. And if you fill that out with your name and address and phone number um, and all your contact info, and then you can kind of fill out what you would like us to do to the fiber. If you have no idea, just write, please call me on it and we can discuss it in detail and you can mail it in um, or you're welcome to come if you're close to drop off and you know we can talk about it. The nice thing about coming is that we can show you what we have on the floor. So sometimes people don't know what they want until they see it. Um, so it, it's kind of fun to see what we're doing for other people. I don't have any other questions in the queue at the moment. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? Um, uh, I'm curious as to how many people use their cashmere for their own personal use and how many people are in it for selling or see a personal sell selling oh one person does both the next person sells mm -hmm. so it looks like a combination but primarily okay. selling Right, so I mean, one thing we didn't talk about was different yarn options. Um, so just because you have, you know, a couple of pounds of cashmere, and obviously if you're selling, you've got that, you know, perspective and that agenda, but if you're not, um, you know, there's nothing to say that you can't take your cashmere and make a 20% cashmere blend with something else. Um, if you wanted, if you enjoy knitting with, you know, an Aran weight yarn or a bulky yarn, or, um, you know, you really want to make a chunky hat that's really popular right now. Um, I, I really encourage people kind of um, open up their thinking that you can still enjoy your cashmere without it being 100%. Um, it's, it's perfectly okay. And if you think about it, regardless of the size of the yarn you make from 100% cashmere, there's a lot of cashmere inside the yarn that is hidden from view. And um, it, it can be um, a nice way to increase the usability or the scope of, of how you're enjoying your cashmere by doing some different yarns with it than the traditional, you know, lace or fingering. We do a lot of processing for some Inuit folks and, you know, they are the ones that are actually harvesting the Arctic muskox and, and combing out the hides and I will never forget the phone call I had with this lovely woman. And I was telling her how, you know, typically you want to make a lace yarn because you're going to optimize 
the yardage from the kiviat because it's you know it's rare and if you go thicker it can get quite warm and there was this silence on the end of the phone and i thought oh dear did i say something wrong and she chuckled and she said there is no such thing as too warm <laughs> so I didn't realize that I was talking to somebody on the other side of, of the uh, country and her experience was quite different. And believe it or not, I, I make some thick yarns um, for those folks with the kiviet and we blend and, you know, sometimes we don't, but often we're, we're blending and making, you know, just some luscious yarns. So, um, I, I encourage people to broaden their scopes if if they're so inclined. A question from Gretchen just came in. She says she has Jacob sheep. Is there a good ratio for my cashmere with their wool? Ooh. Um, well, my response is maybe not blend your cashmere with the Jacob. I mean, the Jacob is a beautiful medium grade wool, but it might kind of engulf cashmere a bit. Um, however, saying that, I think if you wanted to try it and, and you know, it's your fiber. So that has value right there. I would do at I would do at least 15%, 15 or 20%. And then that way I think that would balance out nicely. I think any less, the cashmere might fall out. And any more, it might just be, you know, a waste of the cashmere. You might not be happy with the texture of the fabric that that makes. But the only way to know is to try it, unfortunately. I think that wraps up all the questions that we have on our end. Um, and, and you've very generously gone over time with us. We really appreciate you spending all the time answering all these questions. And uh, we especially appreciate the tour and getting to see the equipment. Um, so I just wanna thank you on behalf of CGA and everyone in attendance and everyone that will watch this uh, future recording. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And um, I'm sure you'll be hearing from many of us soon if you haven't already. Oh, you're welcome. It was my pleasure. Hope everyone has a good night and those um, in Europe, thank you so much for joining us so late and uh, David, uh, have a good day. <laughs> we have people from around the world today. Thank you all, everybody have, have a great, great time. Bye.